Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today we're going to look at the bank curve physics problem. Uh, this is a problem you're going to come across when you first start looking at uniform circular motion. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to look at one of these cars going around a banked curve. So the banked curve simply means that the road makes an angle with respect to the horizontal, and I can call that angle theta. If I look at one of these cars, if I would look at it from the top, I notice that in this curve section, I could characterize the curve by a particular radius. Now to keep something, or to keep the problem rather simple, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to neglect the forces of friction in this problem. And you're gonna see you actually don't need any friction in order to navigate this turn as long as the, the street or the road makes an angle with respect to the horizontal. The other thing to consider about this problem is uniform circular motion. So we're considering the case here where the speed of the cars is constant. So let me write that down. So V is going to be a constant value in these problems. Now careful, this does not mean that the velocity is constant. The velocity constantly changes when you go around in a circle. All right, so let's set up the free body diagram. Let's solve the equations and let's calculate how fast cars would be able to go at Talladega racetrack if there was no friction. Again, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing on my channel, consider subscribing. And if you have any questions about this video or any other physics questions, just leave them in the comments section and I'll get back to you. All right, so here are two uh, different views of the same picture. It looks like a different car. I apologize about that. Um, so this is just kind of a cross-sectional view. Again, the car is going around a circle. And over here, the picture at the bottom shows you the top-down view, right? At different snapshots when the car is kind of moving along this circular path. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what are the, all the forces acting on the system, acting on the car, when it's going around this circle? And it's actually pretty straightforward. So we're gonna first start with the weight, right? This car here has a weight, and the weight you simply represent it by a force acting at the center of gravity or at the center of mass of the object. And that force is simply W, which is the weight, and that's equal to mg, the mass of the car multiplied by little g. Uh, the other force that's acting on the car now, um, the car tires are in contact with the road so therefore, there is a normal force, that is the road pushing up on the car tires, and all of those forces I'm just gonna include into one force, and that is what I'm going to call the normal force. And that is it. This is what the free body diagram looks like now for this particular, <laughs> for this particular car going on this embankment. If you look at it from the top down now, I wanna highlight a couple things. First of all, if I go plot the velocity at any instant on this trajectory, for example, if I plot the velocity over here, it's got a vector v, and it's pointing tangent to the trajectory. If I do it over here, again, it's always tangent to the trajectory, and the length of that vector should be the same as the first one that I drew, because the speed is constant. Now these blue lines, one thing you should remember is that these blue lines here, this here simply represents the direction of the net force and also the acceleration. And what we call that, we call this the centripetal acceleration. Now this is on the top down view. If I was gonna go on this diagram over here and tell me or tell you what the direction of the acceleration is, again, it's always toward the center of the circle if something is moving at constant speed. So again, that's not a force, so I'm not really putting it on the diagram, but I just want to highlight that this acceleration here, this centripetal acceleration, is acting toward the center of the circle. So that means that the net force has to also be acting toward the center of the circle. All right, one thing to notice now is, now I have to break things down into components. And you have to ask yourself, well, which coordinate system should I use? Usually when you look at an object going on a slope, a lot of times you use a coordinate system that looks like this, where this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. Now for this particular problem, it's really not a good idea to use this coordinate system because the reason you don't want x to be down, uh, down the slope like this is because the acceleration is actually at an angle, right? The acceleration is just simply toward the center of the circle. Therefore, it's always best to choose a coordinate system where you have at least one axis that's acting in the same direction of the acceleration, which you know in this case. 
I mean, if you didn't know that acceleration, in that case, you could kind of choose any coordinate system. But in this case, we do know. So I'm going to call this the positive x direction. And I'm going to call this the positive y direction. And now let's get rid of that other one, that first coordinate system, because that's really not a good choice for this particular problem. So what does this mean? Well, now when I'm applying Newton's laws, what I want to do now is I want to break down the forces into components, into x direction components, and into y forces. So this is what we're going to do now. And I don't have to really worry about the weight. The weight is already acting along the negative y direction here. However, what I can do now is if I extend this line a little bit, now you can see that the normal force I can break down into two forces. Uh, the normal force, let's choose a blue for the y component. Right, the normal force has a component of its force here in the vertical direction. That's I'll call that N subscript Y. And the normal force also has a component here that's acting toward the center of the circle. Call that N subscript X. Okay, so now actually if you look in the X direction, there's really only one force acting in the X direction. That's this component of the normal force, NX. So there has to be a net force in the x direction. The way I've picked the coordinate system now, there is no net force in the vertical direction. There's no net force in the vertical direction because the car would be accelerating up or down like this and it's not doing that. All right, the only other thing we really need to add now is where is this angle theta here? If I go back, uh, if, you, if you're a little bit careful with some of the trigonometry, you should convince yourself that the angle theta is actually this one. Okay, so make sure you understand that. You'll have to kind of maybe work at this triangle a little bit more just to see that. Sometimes if you exaggerate the angles, it'll become a little bit more clear. All right, so now that we've got the coordinate system, we've got all our forces, all we have to do now is, I'm gonna start by writing down those components. So the component NY, I can simply write as N, and that's multiplied by cos of the angle theta. And NX, that component of the normal force that acts toward the center of the circle, that is simply going to be the normal force, that purple one, multiplied by sine of the angle theta. Okay, so those are two important relationships. And now what I can do is now I can apply Newton's second law to this problem. Newton's second law says you add up all the forces. If I add up all the forces in the x direction, that is the direction toward the center of the circle. That has to be equal to mass of the car multiplied by the acceleration toward the center of the circle, this AC. So let's go ahead and do that one first. We'll call this equation one. So equation one now, let's look. There's only one force toward the center of the circle, and that force is NX. And NX, I just told you, it was N multiplied by sine of the angle theta. So that there has to be equal to mass times acceleration, and it's the centripetal acceleration. Now, if you remember, for things going around in a circle at constant speed, the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration AC was given by V squared divided by the radius of that circle. All right, so in this case, if you look at it from the top, uh, the radius of the circle would be this radius over here, the distance basically from the, the path all the way to the center of the circle. That is what I'm calling the radius R. All right, so that means I can substitute my value here for centripetal acceleration. So this term here, the right-hand side of Newton's second law, simply becomes this, mv squared over r uh, equals to nx. So super important equation over here. Let's highlight it um, and come back to it in just a second. All right, equation two now is going to be the sum of the forces in the vertical direction. All right, some of the forces in the vertical direction, in this case, those have to be equal to zero. There is no acceleration in this vertical direction. So we have two forces, uh, NY, which is acting up, uh, that's gonna be the positive direction, and minus the weight, uh, which is acting down. Now, if you actually substitute the values in here, uh, again, what you're gonna find here, again, I have NY uh, equals to the weight, MG, and the expression I had for NY was given by that expression at the top, which is N cos of the angle theta uh, equals to mg. All right, again, let's highlight that expression. This one is also super important. All right, now we're going to put it all together. 
All right, so if you were asked how fast, not how far, how fast can you go around the curve here and going around the curve and keeping the same radius, right? You don't want to kind of go off and end up into the ditch or into the crowd. So how fast can I go around this curve? And here are my two equations. Uh, what I want to do now is basically just eliminate the normal force. So if I start from two, I'll call that equation two prime. I can isolate my normal force. So this is simply mg. Uh, divided by cos of theta. And then I substitute in equation one because I want an expression for the speed and I don't want it to include the normal force because I don't really know that. Uh, so let's go ahead now and substitute this normal force into this equation. So what you end up getting here is, so the normal force was mg uh, divided by cos of the angle theta. And I still have my original trigonometric function here, the sine of theta. And that there has to be equal to m v squared divided by r. So a couple simplifications that we have here. First of all, uh, the masses are going to cancel out. Uh, the other thing I could do now is I can kind of group the trig functions, right? I have sine divided by cos. Uh, that is tangent of theta, okay? And then what you simply do is bring the radius in on the other side. So we're gonna get one expression for v. To eliminate the square, you simply take the square root. And now this here becomes g multiplied by r, and then you get tangent of the angle theta. So we're doing this experiment here, or we're racing these races on Earth. So little g is 9.8. Uh, that we know. Little g, let's write that down, 9.8 uh, meters per second squared. Uh, the radius, again, that's defined by the track. And now the angle also is important, right? First of all, let's look at a couple limits. What happens if the angle theta is equal to zero, right? If the angle theta is equal to zero, it means there is no banked curve, right? The road would be flat. And the only thing you can do there is actually <laughs> the velocity would also be zero. Now, if you do have some angle, like at any racetrack, you'll notice that, right? The roads around the corners tend to have a small angle. It could be 10 degrees, 20 degrees. At Talladega, one of the curves is over 30 degrees, so tangent of 30 degrees will give you some number. And again, that track will have a particular radius, so you can calculate, even without any friction, how fast the cars would safely navigate around this turn. So let's go ahead now and look at an actual example and plug in numbers and see what we get. All right, so for our numerical example, we're gonna to go to Talladega Racetrack. Uh, I looked up some data on the racetrack. The radius here of one of the turns is approximately 1,100 feet. And the angle of that banked curve, one of the banked curves around that racetrack is 33 degrees. Now that's incredible. Now you may not appreciate how kind of, how big of an angle that is, but have a look at this picture of a couple guys here just standing on that racetrack. It's just so you can get a feel of how big 33 degrees is when you're standing on a road. All right, so the calculation's pretty straightforward. I guess you just have to work with the right units here. Uh, since the radius is 1,100 feet, uh, the first thing I did was just to convert it. Well, one foot is approximately 0 0.3048 meters. So that allows you to calculate this radius here in meters. So that's pretty straightforward. So the radius in meters that I got was 335, uh, say 0.28. All right, uh, little g we know is 9.8 and tangent of the angle, which is going to be 33 degrees. So when you substitute everything in here, let's go ahead and do that. So this is 9.8. Uh, the radius we just calculated, 335.28 meters. And now we're gonna get tangent of 33 degrees. So that there is going to give me a speed, and that speed's going to be in meters per second just because of all the units that I have. And what I did was I calculated that, and that was approximately 46.2 meters per second. Uh, what I don't like about <laughs> calculating speed in meters per second is I don't really have a good feel of how fast that is. I guess that's pretty fast. 46 meters is a pretty far distance, but let's calculate it. Since we're talking about cars, uh, let's try to calculate it now in miles per hour. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna convert 46.2 uh, meters per second. And what I wanna do is I wanna eliminate meters um, and I wanna get miles. And the other thing is I want to eliminate seconds and I want to get hours at the end. Okay. 
Uh, so in one hour, there are 3,600 seconds. And uh, if you're a runner, you should know that in 3.1 miles, there is 5,000 meters. <laughs> All right, so now if you evaluate everything here, so just multiply that through and divide by the 5,000. Now you can see all the units that are going to cancel out. Meters cancel out here. Seconds cancel out here. And you're going to be left with miles per hour down below here. So, and at the end, what I ended up getting was approximately 103.1 miles per hour. And that's pretty fast. Uh, so even without any friction between the tires and the road, you're still going to hit 100 miles an hour. Now these cars go much faster than that. And that's because of the force of friction between the tires. So in the other example that I'm going to do in my next video, which I'm going to link uh, down below, I'm going to look at uh, what happens when I add friction to this problem. How does it change the free body diagram? And we'll go back to Talladega and see if we can uh, get some new numbers when we include the force of friction.